Have you ever met one of those people who just can't stop? It's like they're unstoppable. Yeah, I have. Me too. What's their mystique? Nothing stops these people. Welcome to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. You're about to meet some of the most amazing people. They've accomplished their goals despite insurmountable odds. They beat adversity, physical hardship, and traumatic events, and emerge triumphantly. They're people just like you and me, and they're winners. Are you unstoppable? Here's Frankie to show you how. Not letting me know for sure, but welcome to the Good Radio Network. This is Mission Unstoppable Live. I'm your host, Frankie Picasso, and my guest today is Dr. Glenn Livingston. Uh, he is a veteran psychologist and author of Never Binge Again. It's an outrageous, innovative, and hilarious approach, the book is anyway, to weight loss that doesn't involve following a diet or eating weird food. Ah, that's kind of nice. He, has, um, he was a longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. He was disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food obsessed individuals. And he spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating by funding his own research program. Wow, with more than 40,000 participants. And kind of like the hair club for men president, he was also his own client. Glenn went on, <laughs> his, oh, <laughs> he went on uh, his own personal journey out of obesity and food prison to a normal healthy weight and a much more lighthearted, as you can hear him, uh, relationship with food. Welcome, Glenn. <laughs> Thank you. It's a delight to be here. I, you know, I, uh, I forgot who said this first, but I no longer have a forehead. I have a five head. So oh, that's <laughs> funny. That's... hair clip for a minute is not entirely inappropriate. No. Come Thank on. you for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. Yeah, me too. Um, you know, this is Mission Unstoppable, and I always like to kind of go back and figure out how people got to be unstoppable in their lives. And so Glenn is a little boy. Were you thinking about food all the time? Do you think, gee, I'm going to be a food researcher when I grow up? What were you going to be? How did I, you fall into this? I was thinking about food all the time when I was a little boy. My, my, I don't think I had a vegetable until I was 21 years old. Really? My, my, my mom used to buy me a big box of chocolate Pop-Tarts every day and leave it on the counter. And we had a case of Coca-Cola. Oh, was my God. This was 1968, something like that. And, um, yeah, I don't know entirely what she was thinking, but... I guess she thought I liked it and it made me happy. And when I got to be 16, 17 years old, I, I figured out that because I'm 6'4 and reasonably muscular, if I worked out hard every day, I could eat whatever I wanted to. So I wasn't, I wasn't fat. I mean, I was a little chubby when I was a kid, but when I got to be an adolescent, I was relatively thin because I was working out all the time and I could have six, 7,000 calories a day of you know, multiple whatever. pizzas yeah. and lattes and Dunkin' Donuts, whatever. Typical whatever. male food orgy stuff. Yeah. You know, I didn't think it was a problem. Yeah. But it, it was a problem. I was wasting a lot of time, actually. And when I got a little older, um, I come from a family of 17 psychologists and psychotherapists. Oh, wow. And was your mom a psychologist? Psych or she yeah. Was, yeah? And the where did you, where did you grow up? I grew up in Great Nick, Long Island. Oh, in Long Island. Okay. My yeah, mother was I'm, from Long Island. What part? I don't know. She's, I don't know. I, I don't know. She passed on. I can't even ask her. I, well, I'm I could, sorry. I guess, but <laughs> my, my my mom has passed on. Also, shall we? Should we? Should we ask? Yeah, let's ask the mom. Where did you guys know each other? I know she went to Hunter College, and um, my, my mother went to Hunter College. Did she Didn't get out? Really? Yeah, she. My mother took um, economics. She got her master's in economics, and 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 she was a diet dietitian for a while. Yeah, it's kind of wow. cool. Wow. What? Uh, how old was your mom when she passed? She was seventy-seven in two thousand seventeen. She was born in nineteen forty. Okay. Oh, 1940. Yeah. I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, my mom and I are 30 years apart, and I, I, I so she must have 36. I'm 61. She was. I don't know. Do the math. I can't do the yeah, math. Yeah, I'm, I'm anyway. 54. So it's probably just a couple of years off. Although she went to college late. She went. What is she? She got married early. They might be. They might have been there together. Maybe they're listening. But together. that's kind of cool. Yeah. 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 They're probably listening yeah. together, going, "Oh my God, look at those two. Can't even add." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so the problem was when I got a little older and I was married and in graduate school and I had patients and all these responsibilities and a commute, I couldn't find three hours a day to work out. And I got fat because I kept eating like I was eating. Like once these foods get a hold of you, you 
kind of have this life of their own and it's really hard to stop. And go on, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I just, I just have so many questions. And, and I, I guess, you know, one of them was that you, 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 you write about you can't love yourself to weight loss. You can't, you can't be that loving, oh, you're such a, you know, wonderful, beautiful person. Well, you can, but not with the food part of you. So, I mean, a lot of people grow up like you did, eating Pop-Tarts and eating whatever, and their bodies magically, you know, keep them thin. Not me. I wasn't one of them. Uh, and then they hit a certain age, you know, 40, 50, 60, and they start to see a little difference. And they're like, oh my God. But you know, it's interesting because men never see themselves as fat. They always just think they're hunky anyway. Um, women are I, I, I obsessed did not think over I was, it. I did not think I was hunky. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they always say they're God's gift. But, but women are obsessed all the time. And my mother did it to me when I was nine years old, saying I couldn't have a puppy unless I lost a few pounds. Oh. Set me up. I mean, I didn't figure it out till maybe 10 years ago. But it set me up for a lifetime of I don't deserve to go here, to do this, to do anything, unless I lose a few pounds. Yeah. It's a crazy way to live your life. Well, m most people who struggle with food have an overly harsh superego, like the way that they judge themselves about food. And it's, it's reinforced by our culture, where their fat shaming is definitely a problem. And the obsession with thinness is a problem. It turns out that being thinner is, in many ways, healthier. But, but um, there are, there's a much wider range of health than you would think from the portrait that's played on television and magazines and everything like that. And a lot of the work that I do with women, often we will come to the point of saying, I remember this one lady for about six months, she was telling me she was so fat and I was afraid to ask her. I was afraid to ask because I thought maybe she's 200 pounds overweight and she just didn't want to tell me. And she said, she's not, she's not getting any closer to her goal weight. And finally I said, well, what do you weigh now and what's your goal weight? And she said, well, I weigh 131 and my goal weight's 125. <laughs> and, and That's my daughter. That, yeah, yeah, stick. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So why, why can't you love yourself then? That's what you want to know? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of get it because you have to love yourself enough to do this. You have to love yourself enough to say, I'm not going to eat certain food, I think. Um, but you can't mamby-pamby yourself because you'll give in to yourself, say, okay, I'll give you a sucker. Come well, on. It's, it's a little more than that, though. So if I, I'll try to fast forward through my story a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I wound up going to Overeaters Anonymous and seeing every did psychologist. Really? I did. How much overweight were you? I was about, my top weight was about 260, but I wasn't exercising. But you were 6'4", you said. Yeah, well, I'm about 208 right now. Okay, um, so you weren't that overweight. For you, you felt overweight. You, you know, some people tell me, how could you possibly know anything about obesity and weight loss if you never lost 100 pounds? And I said, well, gee, if I'd known it was going to be so much of a badge of honor, I would have made sure to gain another 50 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, lost, yeah. I've lost 100 pounds a number of times. Okay. Yeah. It's, it was a miserable existence. Food overtook my life. I would be sitting with suicidal patients, and you got to be really present to work with suicidal patients. And I'd be thinking, when can I go get pizza? When can I go get a box of snack wells? And you're telling and, them, you can't eat that. You can't eat that. Well, no, I wasn't saying that to them, but yeah. you, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, so, so I, went, I went the psychological route trying to love myself then. I eventually did this 40,000-person study because I was getting paid a lot of money to do all these big research studies, and I figured maybe they're valuable. So let me try to figure this out myself. And I looked at a whole bunch of personality variables and life satisfaction variables and work satisfaction variables as compared to what people were binging on. And I found three interesting things. I was always a chocolate binger. Chocolate bingers tend to be lonely or depressed. Uh, people that binge on the people that binge on um, crunchy, salty things like chips and pretzels, they tend to be stressed at work. People that binge on soft, chewy things like bagels and pasta and bread, they tend to be stressed at home. And I okay, thought wait, that was- wait. So what happens if you, if you all three? Then you would tend to have all three, past. all three problems. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but well, welcome to the, the welcome to the club sister. I understand the, the chocolate. I did a speech on chocolate once. Well, besides being a psychotropic food, chocolate is almost it has the language of love, and you know, I mean, it kind of does. And it does not going to ever tell you that you're fat. It's not ever going to tell you no. Um, but 
if you say, oh God, you, you know, you love a kiss, it's like, mm, and you talk with it, mm. So the language is kind of same, the same feelings happen, yeah. right? When you eat chocolate. And so you probably are lonely. Yeah. You're a big chocolate binger. Yeah. That's your boyfriend but or girlfriend. So I figured that was going to fix it. I figured then I'll know what people are struggling with. I'll know what I'm struggling with. Now I know what to work on. And I'll just go fix being lonely and brokenhearted, which was anything but easy. I was in a bad marriage at the time. Oh, no. And, and so I went to my mom, who was a psychotherapist. I'll tell you a story. I went to my mom when I found, found that out. I said, Mom, I struggle with chocolate so much. I just did this study. It says that I must be lonely or brokenhearted. I'm having trouble with my wife, but is there anything in my upbringing? You're a therapist. You raised me. Chocolate pop tarts. <laughs> well, yeah, she said that too, but she actually went back to something earlier. And she said when I was one year old that my dad was in the army and her grandfather, her father just got out of jail. And her whole life, she had adored the man. She didn't know that he was guilty about these things. And she was devastatingly depressed. And she was terrified. My dad was a captain. They were going to send him to Vietnam. And she didn't have the wherewithal to hug me and love me and hold me when I came running to her all the time. So she got a big bottle of Bosco chocolate syrup and she put it in a refrigerator on the floor. And she said, go get your Bosco, Glenn. Go get oh, your Bosco. Oh, wow. That was love. If this were the movies, she and I would have a big hug and a big cry, and then I'd never have trouble with chocolate again, right? But, but it's not the movies. It, it actually got worse. Do you know why it got worse? It got, okay, take a guess if you want to. Well, I, I, I think it got worse. Well, it was, it's imprinted in your, in your subconscious, but other than that, okay, tell me why it got worse. It, it got worse because there was this little voice in my head that said something like this. Mommy screwed me up. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, hey, Glenn, you're right. Your mama left a big chocolate sized hole in your heart. And until you can find the love of your life, you're going to go out and get as much chocolate as you can. Let's go get some right now. Yippee. Yeah. What I learned from that, it was a very soulful conversation to have. I learned a lot about my mom. I forgave myself. I forgave her. It's good to have those conversations. But what I learned from that was it's not necessarily figuring out why that fixes the problem. It's kind of like there's a big fire in the house and the reason the fire can do damage is because the fireplace is not strong enough. And it's more important to fix the fireplace than it is to put out the fire. That fire can keep the house warm. There are all, all types of strong emotions that people have that can fuel them and fuel relationships and passion and everything like that. You don't necessarily want to put all those fires out. But it's that voice, that voice that justifies and makes it okay. That's the problem. At the same time, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. At the, at the same I figured that time I figured that out, I was studying some alternative addiction treatment literature because I was coming out of Overeaters Anonymous. And I came across a guy named Jack Trimpey, and he essentially turned me on to the idea that addiction resides in the lizard brain, in the, reptil in the reptilian brain. Now, what I know about neurology is that the reptilian brain is the earliest evolved part of our brain, that when it looks at something in the environment, there is no love there. What it thinks is, do I eat it, do I mate with it, or do I kill it? Very primitive. Eat, mate, or kill. There's no love. Love and spirituality and art and music and family and relationships and contribution and everything that we value as human beings, that lives in the neocortex. Mm -hmm. um, much, much more in the upper parts of our brains that evolve later in order to inhibit the limbic system and the, you know, the, and the, the reptilian brain. Yeah. So that before you eat, mate, or kill something, it says, wait a minute, what impact does this have on all the things we care about, including our long-term plans and goals and diets and everything like that? So we, it's almost like we've got two brains in there. And that's, that's why you can read a diet book over the weekend and then on Monday morning, you're at Starbucks and there's a big Harry chocolate bar in front of you. And you hear this little voice in your head that says, you know, chocolate comes from a cocoa bean and that grows on a plant. And so chocolate's really a vegetable. And that, that's your, that's the fight or flight, flight response, stealing your rational abilities to justify the binge. And what I discovered was it was much easier to make really clear lines in the sand, rules as opposed to guidelines. Our culture tells us you're supposed to use guidelines, but it's not, I don't believe that's true. Rules as opposed to guidelines that really distinguish healthy versus unhealthy eating. And then once you have those rules, like 
I will never have chocolate on a weekday again, Monday through Friday, then the moment you hear a voice in your head that suggests that you should have chocolate on a weekday, you know that that's your reptilian brain. So here's the embarrassing part. Here's how I recovered after 30 years of suffering and doing everything with food that anybody else has ever done. There's nobody that should be ashamed to talk to me about food because I've eaten out of the garbage and off the floor. <laughs> no. I, I mean, the floor adds a little bit of flavor and um, sold my roommate's food like and gone to, gone to seven drive throughs Nobody should be ashamed of talking to me about food. After 30 years of suffering and all my sophisticated psychological research and knowledge, what I did was I said, okay, I got to figure out how to dominate this reptilian brain. So I'm going to call my reptilian brain my inner pig. I wish I chose another word. It was a bad word. I never thought I was going to publish this. It was just a journal. I'm going to call it my inner pig. I'm going to draw a line on the sand. I will never eat chocolate Monday through Friday. A whole bunch of other rules you could make. If I heard the pig squealing for chocolate, I'd say, I don't want that. My pig does. Chocolate is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. As primitive and crude and disgusting as that is, that's what woke me up at the moment of impulse and gave me those extra microseconds to remember who I was, remember right. who I wanted to be around chocolate. And ever so slowly, I started to be able to make choices. I okay, I'm gonna stop you just for a sec. Yeah. Because I got a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah. Now there's a there's a saying, not um, nothing tastes as good as thin feels. Yeah. Okay, I've heard you hear that diet places all over the place. Now, if you're like a person like me, and I don't know how many times you had to lose weight or not, but I've gained and lost my whole entire life. As a matter of fact, I probably have clothes in my closet from here to here, right? All different sizes. And yeah, it feels really good when you're thin for a little bit, but if it feels that great, why do you start eating again? Because... The, there are billions of dollars targeted at your reptilian brain to give you unimaginable pleasure that evolution didn't prepare you for. There were no chocolate bars in the savanna. There were no potato chips or pasta or pizza in the tropics. Yeah. When we were evolving, we did not evolve for these supersized stimuli. And now the corporations are putting uh, the best research scientists and billions of dollars into engineering these hyperpalatable food-like substances. It's concentrations of starch and sugar and fat yeah. and oil and excitotoxins. And then it's wrapped in packaging that's designed to make you think that it's got nutrition. But the, they'll hit your bliss point, but they don't give you the nutrition to make you feel satisfied. And so you want more and more and more. There is a series of animal studies way back into the 50s and early 60s, Milner and Olds. And what they showed was that, this is not an ethical vegan study, but it was done put a electrode into a rat's brain into the pleasure center. Wire that to a lever. Let the rat press the lever as much as it wants to. You mm -hmm. know what those rats do? Press, press, press. To the exclusion of everything else. They ignore their survival needs. A starving rat will press that button until it dies. Like a, a nursing, rat. Yeah. A nursing mother rat will ignore her pups. They'll crawl over painful electrical grids to get to that. Now, no one's putting electrodes in our brains. Those studies have been replicated with higher mammals, by the way, including humans. I think including humans. I know definitely higher mammals. Nobody's putting an electrode in our brains, but is it such a far cry to say that we're being given pleasure buttons when you walk out of a McDonald's and right across the street there's another McDonald's? Yeah, but let me, let, let's stop you there. Because they, didn't, they didn't put an electrode in your brain, but a message did go in our brain a long, long time ago that if I have this, I'm going to feel really good. Yeah. I might only feel good for five minutes, yeah. but I need that because that's my automatic commitment, my response to not feeling good. That's yeah. my commitment, right? Yeah. And so that, that message is there. Did you have, you've replaced that by saying you, you put rules around it. But if I'm somebody who doesn't like rules, as a matter of fact, when I read that, I panicked. I got a panicky feeling. Oh my God. I yeah. can never, ever, ever have that again. I panicked. Not that I eat because I cut everything in half. I never eat till I'm full. Like I'm really good about not eating. I mean, I can have a chocolate bar last an entire two weeks. Mm -hmm. One chocolate bar, you know, it's there. As long as it's there, that's cool. I don't have to eat it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's there for something, for some reason, right? So for people who, who, who are afraid of rules, like me, because freedom is like my number one value, mm -hmm. um, 
I look at, I look around at different, like your, your plan does not have anything to do with diets. You get to choose whatever you want to eat. It's all up to the individual to eat what they want. Right. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I've done keto, I've done all the diets and then I, st I come back to Weight Watchers in theory going, I can eat whatever I want. So I don't have to obsess about food because I can eat whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Right. Which makes sense to the way I'm wired. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's wired the same way. Right. Some people go, Oh, I, I can eat as much as I want of anything of this meat. I don't care about meat and I don't care about pasta. I don't care about bread. I don't care about anything really. I'm a grazer. I just like to just let me have something when I need it. <laughs> right? I'm sure there's a lot of those out there too. So what have you found with people who really aren't bingers? Cause I, I really don't binge. I never, um, but I gain weight easily. Mm -hmm. So I, there are a bunch of points in there that I could help you with. Okay. And let, let me say I'm open to the idea that the program isn't for everyone, but the fear that you have is exaggerated with regards to what you're actually prescribing. W what I tell people, first of all, is that when I use the word never, like I'll never eat chocolate Monday to Friday again, um, you make up those rules yourself, but I'm using it in the same way that I would tell a two-year-old little girl that she always has to hold my hand when we cross the street. Little Sarah, you can never, ever, ever cross the street without holding my hand. Now, I know that with maturity and wisdom, I'll be able to teach her in five or six years how to look both ways and cross the street. But I don't tell her that because it's dangerous. Right. I don't want her. So our reptilian brains, our inner food demons, our pigs, they act like two-year-olds around these foods. And there's a, a psychotically intense offense coming at us. We didn't even talk about the advertising industry and have their 5,000 messages a year about food and maybe a half a dozen of them are about fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Um, th there's too much coming at us. There are those cars whizzing by that are too dangerous. We need to know that we can't jump out in the middle of the street and we present it to them, to the reptilian brain as if it's set in stone. But I tell people, change your food plan anytime you want to. You can change your rules anytime you want to. Just give it 24 hours before it takes effect so that you can evolve your plan as, you know, you develop wisdom or you decide that I don't like this rule anymore. You can or do that. Or is that your piggy telling you to do, yeah. let's do it now so we can have a piece of chocolate. So what, what we're really trying to do is move decision-making from impulse to intellect. Yeah. B binge eating has to do with the fight or flight response. There's an activation of this perception that this is necessary for survival and everything else falls out of the window. So that's one thing I could tell you. The second thing is that while I encourage people to commit with perfection, in the same way that you'd commit to a marriage, like you don't, you don't say, gee, honey, I want to marry you, and I'm 99% I'm sure that I'm not going to sleep with any other women, but there sure are a lot of attractive people out there, and you don't want me to lie, right? So progress, not perfection, I'll do the best I can. Now, there are some commitments we can make with 100% commitment. Um, turns out well, that when- Well, are committed to eating whatever they want. And they, they are. And they're committed. And they it's yeah. A, it's a vow. But the psychology of winning, look at people who climb mountains, look at people who win races, look at people, look at Olympic archers. Before they let go of the arrow, they see the arrow going into the bullseye. It's almost like they are 100% committed to that. If they make a mistake, they take it seriously. If they don't hit the bullseye, they ask, well, what went wrong? Do I need to adjust my stance? Did I not take account of the wind? What went wrong? And then they do it again. Right. What they don't, what they don't do is say, oh my God, I missed the bullseye. I'm a pathetic archer. I might as well shoot the rest of the arrows into the audience. They, they don't do that. So the phrase that I use for this is to commit with perfection and forgive yourself with dignity. So when I say I will never have chocolate Monday to Friday again, if I happen to make a mistake, which in the commitment phase, I say I never will again, but I know this little part of me says, if I did, then I'll go and analyze my food plan. Maybe the rule was too harsh. Maybe, maybe I didn't take good enough care of myself during the day. Maybe I should have eaten more healthy, nutritious food so I wouldn't have been so hungry when I got to that three o'clock meeting, whatever it is. And then I let go of that guilt. I let go of the shame and I just recommit with 100% commitment again. There's one more thing I wanted to tell you, but it's escaping me. Never as food plans. I guess we'll come back to it. Okay. So okay. I, I let's, somebody like me who can very easily do the 12 weeks. I'm a 12 week stepper. I guess. Yeah. Okay. 12 weeks is very easy. And it always seems that at the end of that 12 weeks, there's a Thanksgiving, there's a Christmas, there's a something. And I just let go and I never go back until right. I get disgusted or fed up or get to that point where it's like, Oh my God, girl, just, you felt so good. Go back and do that again. 
what I usually recommend for people who are anticipating a holiday, when this is a good time to talk about it because we're right around the corner from Thanksgiving, is that they eliminate the decisions for Thanksgiving. So there's nothing wrong with saying, I want to eat a little more on Thanksgiving. I know people who say, even though I don't eat flour or sugar, on Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, I can have one dish of whatever I want to. It's, it's like drawing the second rung of the archery target. You know where it stops and where it starts, and you know exactly what you're going to do, so that when you get into the moment, you're not subject to all of the social forces and smells and impulses that you're going to decide upon emotionally. You really want to move it from emotion to intellect. Um, a shortcut for this is to understand that character trumps willpower. So the, there are a lot of studies on willpower these days that say it's a fatigue. I'm sorry, you see my cat in the background? Oh, that's, that's Theo. Um, there are a lot of studies on willpower that say that willpower fatigues. It's not like gas in the tank that some people have and some people don't. It's more like you get a, it's, I'm sorry, it's not like a, like a genetic, genetic switch that's an on and off switch and some people have and some people don't. You get a certain amount of gas in the beginning of the day and it wears down as the day goes by, depending upon how many decisions you have to make. Not just decisions about food. People right. have trouble resisting chocolate if you make them do math problems beforehand. Actually, the studies are with marshmallows. So if you know that and you can eliminate decisions, then what replaces it is character. So if I give you an example, suppose you walk into a diner and in the diner, there is a $10 bill on the table and the waitress hasn't seen her tip yet. She says, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get your menu. And there's nobody up front and there's no window and nobody would see you take the money. 99% of the people I ask about that say, there's no way I would take that money. And I'll say, why? It would benefit you. It would be pleasurable. Do you have to use a lot of willpower not to take them? And they say, no, I don't have to use any willpower because I'm not a thief. Right. So I'll say, so as a matter of character, you've pre-eliminated pleasurable decisions as outside of the realm of possibility. So you're already doing it. You're already forming these character statements all over the place. Why not pick one more? The last thing I want to tell you for, for your benefit, for people who don't like rules, two more things. One is that you can choose rules that don't restrict any foods. So you could choose rules that support mindfulness, like I will always put my fork down between bites or I will never eat in front of a screen again, or I will always take five deep breaths before I go back for seconds. You can do that kind of thing. Gosh, I keep coming to this one thing and I forget it. What's wrong with my head? I'm getting old. It's, it's it'll, it'll come to you. So, okay. okay. So I don't have to do a food rule. I can do a, a, a behavioral rule. Yeah. But I have to do a rule. Well, okay. The, the, the last part is you already are and you don't know it. Yeah. Because there, there are things that you won't eat, right? Like you don't, I don't, you don't eat, eat liver. Yeah. yeah. You don't, don't eat dirt. dark chocolate and I don't eat, there are a lot of things I don't eat. Right. You don't need cat poo or dirt or anything like that. No. I don't even drink alcohol. <laughs> so well, it's well, fair. Okay. So you've already made some decisions. Yeah. I, my, my, I'm just advocating that people make conscious where they want their lines to be so they can have focus and clarity. And then when you have that focus and clarity, you can hear your lizard brain trying to talk you out of it. When right. you can hear the lizard brain trying to talk you out of it, you can disempower that. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know if, if there's a million people like me or not, but when, when you say, okay, every morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to drink eight ounces of water. I think, well, what if I don't feel like drinking eight ounces of water? I don't always feel like doing this or feeling like doing that. And so now I'm going to be forced to do something because I made that decision that I'm going to always do that. And so I don't want to let myself down because I'm already letting myself down by being overweight. So it's just another let down if I, if I know I'm not going to commit to it. So I, do you understand? Do you, do you, yeah, and I'm well, playing the, devil's advocate too. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the goal is to be like a city traffic planner. And if I were planning out a city, I'm trying to optimize two variables. One variable is the freedom and safety. I'm sorry. It's the freedom of the populace to move through the city. I don't want to put a traffic light at an intersection that doesn't need one. Right. right? By the same token, if there's a dangerous intersection, you better believe I have to have a traffic light there or else I'm not being a responsible planner because people are going to get killed. Right. So you want to have a minimum of traffic controls to maximize your freedom. See, here's an odd thought. 
freedom sits on top of discipline. It's only because of the discipline of the engineers that make sure that your car turns 30 degrees to the right when you turn your steering wheel 30 degrees to the right, that you have the freedom to expand your locus of, you know, of, of a locomotion, <laughs> that, that you, you, can get, you can get a lot farther and have a lot more freedom to go. Yeah. It's only because a jazz musician has practiced the scales and understands the structure of yeah, music. Yeah, he can go over, yeah, exactly. And then he can leave that structure and come back to it whenever he wants to. Right. And so I'm advocating the same thing. And most people tell me that at first they were frightened of it, but now it feels much more freeing. The other reason that's really freeing is because if you've made the decisions, then eventually your reptilian brain shuts up. If it knows you're never going to have chocolate Monday through Friday, then it stops squealing at you all day long and you have this freedom of mind to just focus on other things. That's what I want to talk about for a second. The, um, okay, like you said at the very beginning, you, Glenn chose pig and I choose saboteur because it's always yeah. been my saboteur or the members sure. of the board or whatever. So for those who are insulted by pig or find that that's something that um, you've been called a pig in school, piggy piggy, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that's unfortunate. And it has nothing to do with that because it's, it, this, this pig is not you. This pig is separate entity from you. Like your bladder. Yeah. Like, like your bladder. Generates yeah. a strong biological urge that has to be controlled. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, it's a wonderful program. It's a great book. It's, it's a wonderful alternative to everything else that, that is out there. So I don't want people to get turned off by, you know, your pig who squeals or whatever. It could just as easily be the saboteur who, you know, pokes at you or the kid that, you know, teases you or whatever, whatever you want to call it, call it whatever you want. But it is, it makes a lot of sense in so many ways, you know, to me, um, how, you, how one could, could follow a plan and just, you know, Monday to Friday, it's the same as quitting smoking. The, the only difference is the hardest thing because of the addiction is that you cannot get rid of food. You can't just yeah. entirely walk away from food. We have to eat. You gotta take the lion out of the cage and walk it around the block a few times a day. I do, and smell has such an important, um, physiologically and emotionally, you know, memories are tied to smell of food, memories are tied to, to all kinds of things. Realtors put apple pie smells in houses to make you buy them. So we can't leave food, but we can control food. Mm -hmm. and, and what's your, what's your best success story or the most outrageous, crazy story? Do you have one? Um, I mean, I've had people that lost 300 pounds. Wow. Um, I, I get a lot of people that lose 100 pounds. I, you know, we, we, uh, How long does it take them? Like, are they exercisers or they just changed how they ate? Most of my audience doesn't exercise. I try to get them to, like just to walk around the block and get started. But I think that when they're really overweight, I, I work with a lot of people that are just 20 pounds overweight, but I think yeah. when they're really overweight, they just don't want to, it's just uncomfortable or it hurts or, um, I'm always working on that, but I'm not as successful at getting people to exercise as getting them to lose weight with diet. Okay, I, I, I wanna reach out to a certain crowd that I work with a lot because um, I suffer from chronic pain. I was in a really bad motorcycle accident. I broke both femurs, hip, pelvis, everything. Sorry. And just, Sorry. yeah, it's okay. Um, but you know, the pain this past year, two years has been very, very intense. And I work with a lot of people who suffer from chronic pain. And so they can't walk, they can't do a lot of exercise. Uh, they don't sleep. They um, food is maybe the only pleasure that they actually have in their life anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yet they know that the, that the increased weight puts, you know, on their, on their bones and everything is, is harder on them. And so they need to, they need to let it go. Mm -hmm. What can you replace? What, what can you suggest that they replace food with pleasure? What kind of pleasure were? Yeah. Let, let me say a few things about that. Yeah. First of all, I want to qualify that because usually people, people are thinking that industrial food is their only pleasure. You know, the Pop-Tarts or the, yeah. the chips or whatever it is. Um, there's a phenomenon called down-regulation and up-regulation in the nervous system. What that means is, if you have a chocolate bar every day, an apple tastes progressively less sweet because your nervous system stops responding. It's like when I moved in graduate school to live underneath the subway, I didn't know how I was gonna sleep with all the noise, but about a week later, I didn't hear it yeah. because my nervous system down-regulated to that supersized stimulus. So people get to the point where they say, I don't get any pleasure from fruit and vegetables. As a matter of fact, I don't even feel normal if I'm not eating sugar. 
Oh, okay. Because their pleasure response has been so downregulated. Their lizard brain, their saboteur, their pig will tell them, remind me to tell you a social justice story at the end about the pig, but yeah. the, 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 it, it'll tell them you're going to be tortured forever. There will be no pleasure in life. It's not true. What actually happens when you eliminate the chocolate and you start eating fruit is you don't enjoy it for the first week or two. But then your body starts to upregulate it. There's research that says your, your taste buds will double in intensity over I think, six to eight weeks. And before you know it, you start to taste the subtle differences between species of apples or species of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And you restore the pleasure generating ability that God gave you originally. So it's not, it's, it's not true that there's really no other pleasure. That what's true is that your pleasure mechanism has been hijacked by industrial profiteers. And if you say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore, and you step outside of that, you'll get more pleasure. You won't get the same high that you get from a chocolate bar. Chocolate's really a drug. There wasn't any chocolate yeah. on the Savannah. But you'll get an incredible contentment without having to pay the price and that contentment gets stronger and deeper and more gratifying over time the pleasure mechanism also adjusts to experience more pleasure from breathing to feel more pleasure from connecting with other people to experience more pleasure from art or music or work or you know sublimating your energy into a cause, pursuing a charity, helping other people. That there's so many things that become pleasurable that you'll think that what your pig was saying was actually pretty silly. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to believe me now. You're not supposed to believe me. What you tell yourself is feelings aren't facts. It feels like I need this to survive. It feels like, look, hand over the chocolate and nobody gets killed. <laughs> but it's not like that. It's not really like that. It's going to get better over time. Yeah. And you can consciously and purposely make that shift. So when I was having cravings for chocolate and I first started this, I would go and have a kale banana smoothie. And I thought it was disgusting at first, but a couple of weeks later I started to crave the kale banana smoothie. And now I really want one now that I said that. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, Montezuma used to have 40 cups of chocolate, hot chocolate a day. Wow. Can you imagine? Is that why he came up with Montezuma's Revenge? Probably. Probably yeah. somebody took it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You're going to tell me a social justice story about the pig. Um, I'm getting a little Where's famous now that there, there's over 500,000 readers and I've been in a lot of these types of podcasts sure. and people once in a great while, they recognize me, but they don't remember my name. What they do is they, they go, the they, they point at me and they go pig guy. Oh no. Oh, he froze. Yeah. That's funny. So yeah. oink, oink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, okay, so we're successful. You've been very successful with, with helping people come, come to plan, yeah. let's say. And do you find that when you use your system, let's say, that your people are less likely to have to do it 10 times before they're successful or 20 times? Or is it the same as just people going out and dieting? Or Depends upon the person. Depends upon the person. What was your study like? Like, what, what did you actually study when you did your 40,000 people oh, study? 40, so the 40,000 person study was actually wrong-headed. I was looking for, I was looking for the variety of ways you could love yourself thin. Oh, okay. So I, I was looking at the types of emotional difficulties that were related to different types of foods. And I told you the three things that I, that yeah. I know. That didn't solve the problem. No, but people who, who are overweight, Mm -hmm. um, use very destructive language to themselves. Yeah. Right. The, like what they say to themselves inside their head is worse than they would ever say to anybody in their I whole know. entire life. I know. And so how is, could that be a rule? I'm not going to say that to myself anymore. Well, you need to, yes, it could be a rule. And we have, we have a program for thinking more positively, but the, the thing that you really have to do is understand the insight. And the piercing insight is the idea that that destructive self-castigation is binge motivated. See, there, there is a hidden therefore statement beneath, oh, you're so pathetic. 
you're always going to be a fat pig or whatever it is. There's a statement that comes after that that most people don't articulate, which is, but at least there's one thing you can count on, one pleasurable thing in life. Let's go get some right now. Let's go binge. Yippee. It's trying to make you feel too weak to resist the next binge. And Carol Munter told me that it's very difficult to keep binging if you refuse to yell at yourself. That was a piercing insight for me. You oh. really do have to forgive yourself with dignity. And the quicker yeah. you forgive yourself, the faster you're going to stop binging. And what about the idea that I'm not lovable because I'm fat? Society is telling me I'm not lovable because I'm fat. And can't you just love me for me and not how I look or my weight or, you know, you would forgive me if, you, if I had a um, one arm, but I'm fat. Like, can't you forgive me that? Fr fr Frankie, I can. I, 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 could, I could love you because you're fat or thin or wh whatever you happen to look like. I've, well, I'm talking, I've, actually talking about myself. I, I, know, I know. No, I know. I'm, but I'm yeah. in, in playing in, in roles. Sure. Yeah. That I, I do think that's a problem. And I do think that you, you look at most formerly overweight people. Anyone who's really been obese can even see it on my face. We carry a certain amount of shame. But I, I think we need to be turning that shame into anger because of the overwhelming force that's targeted against us, mostly for profit, to get us to be like that. And then we're told that it's a disease, that we're powerless over it, that we couldn't resist if we wanted to. There's no evidence for that. It, it's, um, it's a perfect storm out there for everyone to be overweight. And what's required in, in my history and my understanding and experience, what's required to step out of it is take a breath, do some serious thinking about where the troubled intersections are, figure out if you need a traffic light or a yield sign or a stop sign, like how, how strong a control do you need, yeah. and implement it, observe yourself trying to break it, then look at the, what we didn't talk about was how to disempower the illogical thoughts. For example, when your pig says, you can start tomorrow, it's no big deal, maybe you'll gain a pound. Well, first of all, if you're in a hole, you should stop digging. But secondly, all the research on neuroplasticity says that if you binge today, it's going to be harder to stop tomorrow. You're strengthening those connections. Every bite is either reinforcing or extinguishing an addiction. So every bite is an opportunity to love yourself or hate yourself with food. So I would hope that you would choose to love yourself and always use the present moment to be healthy. You can always use the present moment to be healthy, no matter what happened five seconds, five minutes, or five months ago. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's really good. So do you think that that let's talk about women specifically because there's more of them um, that do this, I think. They say, okay, you know what? I'm not losing weight. I, I'm done. This is me and I'm going to love myself the way I am and I like myself the way I am. And they truly b believe it, I think. Um, and that's okay. Is that okay? Um, if it's healthy, if, they, if they're not at risk. you can for... be in good shape and be overweight. I'm okay with that if they're in good shape and overweight and their doctor is okay with it. I'm okay with it. Yeah. And, yeah. and if they, um, and if they're overweight and they, uh, let's say they have that, you know, what's that disease? The um, polycystic. Polycystic fibrosis? Isn't it poly polycystic something that, and it, and it makes women overweight, like it's almost I'm, like you I'm, can't. For, for medical reasons. They, there are definitely medical problems. Like yeah. That. Yeah. I'll tell you something else. Just want listeners who are listening, like, you know, you don't get a cop out. I don't want you to cop out, but you might. Well, and, and certain people have more of a bad, have been dealt more of a bad hand than others. Everybody in my family was obese. And oh, were they? So my, my ancestors, both sides were obese people. Um, immigrant Jews who grew up on the Lower East Side and, you know, we eat a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> hey, but, you know what? I, you know, during the, like my dad, I, I, I'm writing a book about my dad right now and he's still alive. And, yeah. you know, immigrant Jew um, mm -hmm. was in Austria, grew up in Vienna and, you know, no food. There was no food. Hitler was there and whatever. And they're, for days on end, they're, they're frying their bread and bacon fat because they're just trying to get a little taste. There's no meat anymore. But, right. you know, five days later, we can still fry it in a little bit of fat and feel like we've eaten something good. And I remember my dad making this for me when I was like four years old for breakfast. 
-hmm. And it was like amazing. I'm like, wow, I've never done it since, but it was like amazing. And then two weeks ago, I'm watching a cooking show, a kid's cooking show. And this girl goes, oh, I've got some bacon fat. Maybe I'll just fry some bread in there. And everybody went crazy, went, wow, this is the best thing I've ever eaten. What did you do? Oh, I fried it in bacon fat. Now she's going to start a trend. You know, I can just see it happening. But yeah, everybody in my family has been, you know, food. So, so, so a, a lot of, like, like we talked about earlier in the interview, I think we need to soften our super egos and maybe lower our expectations a little bit about how far we're going to, we're not going to be a supermodel. But I'll tell you something else. We fought wars in this country for our freedom. Mm -hmm. And I would fight for people's ability to decide where on the continuum from live fast and die young to live a long time and enjoy the ride. Um, I think everybody gets to choose where that is. I, I think it was, I have to look up who made this quote because I keep using it. The guy who wrote Tom Sawyer, I think, he, he, he said, if all you focus on is your health, that's all you're going to have is your health. And for a long time, I didn't really get that. Then I said, well, yeah, I suppose if you were the absolute healthiest person around, but you didn't have a career and you didn't have friends and you didn't have money, um, I don't know if that's the 100% best adaptation to society. There is something to be said for choosing a balance and indulging once in a while. And I think everybody has to make up their mind where along that continuum they want to be. And that's why I don't tell people what to eat. That's why I have them choose their own, their own food. And it's brilliant. And, and how many people yeah. say, but Glenn, what should I eat? Everybody does. But <laughs> it, here's the problem with that. If I tell you what to eat, you'll do it for a little while while your inner food demon says, this guy's off his rocker. This, this diet's no good. You know, we'll have, we'll have to we'll prove it. Yeah, let's prove it and let's go find another one. So it's taking, taking responsibility as part of overcoming ad addiction. The biggest problem in addiction is dependence. It's this idea that we are dependent little children who can't make up our own minds and decide for ourselves and take responsibility for what goes into our, you know, how we use our hands and our arms and our legs and our mouth and our tongue and what goes in and what goes out. It's, so I'm very much in favor of freedom and responsibility and try to foster that as much as I can. I can't make you stop. Yeah. This is not a treatment like a gastric bypass. This yeah. is, this is clarity and focus and motivation and tools. Let me ask you something. I, I interviewed um, this young guy and his dad a couple of years ago, and he had created um, a gamification app for addiction, for drug yeah. addiction. Yeah. And it just hit me like, would that be a pleasure for people who are trying to lose weight to have this, this, you know, this thing come at you and go, Oh, look at you. You're wonderful. You know, you, you didn't eat that. So we're going to give you 10 points and you get bells and money and blah, 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 and it all happens. And you're just like, Oh, that felt good. <laughs> we, will it we, work uh, for food? We, we will have that in 2020. We're working on it. Okay. I can't, I can't say much more about it for the investors. Okay. But, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I want to know what Glenn eats. What, you want to know what I eat? Mm -hmm. You don't want to know what I eat. You run away screaming. Wait, here's what I will tell you. I'll tell you that after doing this for many years, I found that my survival drive gradually readjusted to what nature has to offer. So, you know, rather than having pasta, I would have brown rice with some tomato sauce. Um, and then I was interested in having more fruit instead of the brown rice. And things just kind of kept on moving towards, I think, what I would have eaten in nature. And my survival drive adjusts more and more. I got more and more pleasure out of that. There's a guy named Doug Graham who said you should never have to recover from a meal. And that made a lot of sense to me. So I started evaluating everything that I ate against that statement. How much do I have to recover from this? And I recognized that there were only certain foods that I didn't have to recover from. And... So I, I got healthier and healthier and healthier, and it didn't feel like a treat to me anymore to have to recover. I could get that 18-minute high, but it didn't feel like a treat anymore. So I gave up more and more of that stuff, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm missing anything. I feel like I've been granted this phenomenal life. And how easy is it for you to go out and eat? Um, it's not perfectly easy. I have to look at the restaurant beforehand, and I have to talk to the waiter and say, you know, I want you to give me a double salad, and you can charge me for it. And I will look at the... I will look at the ingredients of a dish rather than the dishes themselves. Yeah. And so, so I know they have those ingredients at the restaurant. So if I see that they've got a Caesar salad and portobello steak with mushrooms and they've got, um, you know, steamed Brussels sprouts or something like that, I will ask them to make me a big salad with romaine lettuce and portobello mushrooms and Brussels sprouts because I know they have all three. So you right. can be a little creative about it and you 
you can't be shy about talking to them. But are you vegetarian? Um, gosh, I, I hate to say because then people. My my book is diet agnostic, and I work with people that are ketogenic. Yeah, that's okay. And, yes, I'm 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 vegan. You're vegan I, now. I, I eat vegan. Yeah, whole foods, plant based. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I've been vegan before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard. It, it's hard at first. It's it, hard. It, it was a process. It wasn't. Over many it wasn't years. I didn't really enjoy it that much. But like, I I just find that that so many so many diets have become labor intensive to make, you know, dinners or whatever. Like, I I just came off keto, which was great, but I lost a lot of hair, so that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, uh, paleo was probably a little bit easier because I don't really care about dairy and and stuff mm -hmm. and bread. Mm -hmm and things uh, and you can have a bit of honey so that's that's always good and you don't have to have fake fake sugar so that that, that works yeah. um but you know i don't know if uh, and i did eat perfectly for a while because i saw this nutritionist and i didn't lose any weight and you know i gave up all the white things flour and sugar and just everything that you're not supposed to have rice and i i didn't lose any weight so i don't know if there's a magic or a secret to See, it. I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to, I'm not a dietitian. I'm not yeah. a medical doctor. So I, I kind of stay out of that and I let them fight it out. Um, I would like the whole world to eat the way that I was eating. It would be easier. Yeah. I could, I could go out to eat better. I wouldn't have to have conversations at dinner with everybody about why I was doing what I was doing all the time. But yeah, I've learned to sidestep that as well. Um, yeah. So. Uh, but I do have a stepson who lives with us. He came back home and he eats loads of vegetables, like loads of them. And it's just like, I look at his dinner plate and it's just steamed vegetables, a little bit of meat, but steamed vegetables and he's skinny as a rake. And I thought, yeah, if I, if I could love that, I'd be skinny too. Mm -hmm. But it's so training. People think that that happens immediately. But if you kind of step your way into it, then I find that it's easier to get there. So you have a coaching system. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, what I like people to start with is our free materials, actually, because I can get you a free copy of the book. And a Why bunch is of it free? Why is it? Are you, are you a philanthropist? You just love people so much you want to give away all your Not knowledge? entirely. Not, not entirely. Um, yes, it, it, it's part of my mission to help a million people a year nice. stop overeating. And so I have a model where I give a lot of things away for free, but I have to pay the bills also. Sure. So I people figure people, there are a lot of people that can recover just from the free materials. And if you go to neverbingeagain.com and click on the big red button, you can get a free Kindle. Crap load of free stuff. Crap load of free stuff. But I just want to say the two other things in the crap load are, I can't believe we're calling it a crap load. No, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. There's a set of food plan starter templates. So we show you the kinds of rules that people use for keto versus macrobiotic versus point counting versus vegan versus vegetarian, whatever you happen to eat, whatever your philosophy is, you have a starter plan. And then I recorded a bunch of sessions because this is a weird thing in theory. There's this psychologist and he's got a pig inside of him and he doesn't eat pig slop. It, it, it sounds really harsh, but it's not. It's very compassionate. And if you listen to the sessions, you will hear how people restore their sense of hope and enthusiasm. And it, it's very, very powerful and it's really very easy in practice. And a lot of the fears people have about the rules are unfounded. Yeah. Anyway, that's all at neverbingeagain.com and click the button. Um, I want to say, can I say one thing? Sorry, did you want yeah. to say more about what, they, what they're going to get? Well, no, that, that's it. And, and then you'll be led to the coaching if you want to do that okay. after that. So there, there, you, did a, you did an online coaching session with a woman, a telephone session with her. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was a person. It doesn't matter. We, we're hearing it online, and and you're you're taking her through, and and changing her perspective because at the beginning she goes, oh, I can't do this, and it's not working. Da, da, da. And then you go, but how much do you really want to do? Oh, it's worth be worth a million dollars to me if I if this you know worked for me. And oh yeah, you know my pig I'm not going to eat pig slop. I'm not going to do anything. And as you listen, and even if you're like an overweight person listening, wondering if you should do this, and you're taken through this 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 um, coaching journey, and you're sitting there going, if it's worth a million dollars to you, why don't you do it? Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't I doing it? And it's yeah. like, come on, just take that step. Say it. I'll do it. Say it. <laughs> right? and, and, and it's, if it's so worth a million dollars to all of us, because it is. I mean, everybody that I know is so overweight that really, oh my God, if you could just do this, I guess I've done it so many times and it's so hard and, and why do I have to do it and what, what was me, blah, blah, blah. But if you could just 
why don't you do it? And when you do it, why don't you keep it off? We, we don't do it because we don't take the time to really see what's waiting for us. It's not just a million dollars. It's being able to fit into the clothes that you want to. It's being able to run around with the kids. It's being able to be a good role model for your kids and break the family cycle of you know, diabetes or heart attacks or whatever mm -hmm. has, has happened. It's being able to be closer to your spouse or parents or um, pursue those projects or go out with your friends without being embarrassed. And it's, there's so much, but our reptilian brain keeps us focused on the moment. That's why. So you need to take the time and step back. Write down a specific rule. I tell people to start with the single most troublesome food or, or behavioral trigger that you have. Write down one rule to manage it that you would be willing to follow. And then ask yourself, I know that my, my inner saboteur says this is impossible, but what if it wasn't? Just what if? What if I could do it for a year? what would be different in my life? Mm -hmm. And really flesh that out, paint a very vivid emotional picture of what that would be like. And you'll start to find that those squeals, all the reasons for breaking your rule, they start to seem pathetic in comparison to what you're actually giving up. Um, so, so there's some work that has to be done to bring people from the focus in the present moment and all the deprivation they might feel in the present moment to what they're really depriving themselves of in the future. Right. And I owe, I owe Janine Roth a debt of thanks for first articulating that. Okay. Noted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Glenn, um, I want to thank you for, for writing this book, for being so compassionate to people and really helping them you know, fight that, that inner pig or that saboteur or, or that, that part of them that has been warring with them for so long and giving them an opportunity to uh, have an alternative to everything else that, that's out there. That, that's my goal in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I like I, I, it. I, I, don't, I don't have kids. I won't have grandkids. I, this is what I have. I, I can help people who feel like their life has been overtaken by food to have a choice. But you do have, okay, you didn't want to talk about the coaching, but there is a coaching and there's people who can become coaches. Oh okay. yeah, well we, we, we train and license coaches to do what we do. Um, it's, it's very reasonable, it's ex, there's an extensive amount of support. And um, if you want to look at the coaching program without listening listen to the other stuff, you can go to um, neverbingeagaincoaching.com. That's, that's our little coaching package. It's a combination of group and individual to make it more, more affordable. And you can either work with me or work with my coaches if you want to, and depending upon, you know, what your resources are. And then if you really want to become a coach, you can go to becomeaweightlosscoach.com. But I really recommend going to Never Binge Again and getting yeah, I do too. free stuff because then you can hear the sessions. You can hear how it all actually works. And uh, yeah, that's it. Dr. Glenn Livingston, everybody. Thank you, dear. Frankie Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye, Facebook friends. Okay. We'll, we'll talk to you in a bit. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. Probably. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to have to go in a second.